So Mining Weekly Online is talking to the Deputy Executive Director of the Southern Africa Trust. That is Becky Moyo. And we're talking to him on the eve of a regional dialogue in which the focus is going to be on assisting migrant mine workers. Becky, tell us about this dialogue that you're going to have, why you're going to have it, and uh, what the outcome should be. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, it would be best that I talk a bit about the Southern Africa Trust so that yes. we contextualize the dialogue. Yeah. Uh, we are a regional organization whose mandate is to make sure that policies are developed in such a way and implemented in such a way that they actually contribute towards poverty eradication. And so we really look at the world through the poverty lens, but we also think that regional instruments and regional focus are the way to go. And so one of the things that we have worked on is really to look at some of the marginalized communities or what you would call the poor communities. And uh, mining provides such an opportunity or it provides such an instance where ex-miners, for example, who come from countries as Mozambique, Swaziland, Lesotho, and many others, when they are out of their jobs, they find it very, very difficult to actually access their benefits. So that's one of the challenges. And so we have been engaged in a, in a process where we have conducted research to really establish the fate of these uh, ex-miners, including their beneficiaries, especially for those that have passed on, their wives or, or those that they have nominated to, to benefit from those um, funds or, or some of the benefit schemes they then find it very difficult to access that. So what we have done is to really begin to talk to ex-miners themselves, talk to government officials in most of these countries, uh, to, to, to officials here in South Africa, to the mining companies as well, so that we can establish a mechanism that would allow some of this money to actually go to the people that really need it, the beneficiaries. So one of the outcomes really is a call to say to, for example, the, the workers, the miners' provident fund, give this money to the, to the ex-miners that actually need it and their beneficiaries, but also maybe begin to put in place a regional mechanism that would allow for the portability of social benefits without people necessarily having to travel all the time to come to South Africa, for example, to get their benefits, so that we find a mechanism where bilaterally or regionally um, these uh, ex-miners can be able to access uh, their benefits from their countries uh, without having to travel uh, long distances. One of the challenges, as we will talk further, is that uh, some people spend so much of their money trying to access the benefits. By the time they get to the actual amount, they realize they've spent more than what is due to them. So no, those are some of the challenges. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to interrogate how they are having a difficulty to access those benefits because, um, you know, major mining companies, if people uh, are g go on pension, surely they are... Uh, accessing their, their provident fund almost immediately and there's an organization called TEBA which has got quite a long reach to, to make sure that uh, these funds can get to them. So what sort of benefits are you talking about? Yeah, so it's a, it's a whole range of, of, of benefits. I mean, most of them would, would be to do with maybe the insurance and, you know, all, all of the housing and all of those things. But basically the challenges have to do with a lot of things. One is documentation. Uh, most of the miners who come from outside the, the country, um, they, they normally don't have proper documentation. And when it's time to actually apply for their benefits, it's difficult to do that. And that applies also to their, to their wives if they, are, if, if, if they have passed on. They could, they could actually come here having a particular documentation which doesn't actually tally with the one that was used when the, the miner was here. So, that, so that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is that some of these miners actually don't know how to actually approach the system. Uh, is they only discover when they need the money and they've left the country that these are the procedures, these are the processes that they must follow. So that's one of the areas that, you know, what the Trust has been doing in, with, with the national associations of ex-miners is to try and begin to help them understand what is the procedure, what are the systems that need to be followed in place and so forth and so on. But the other challenge is also that <coughs> once, once these people leave, some of them are actually already sick. And for them to come back here when they are in, their, in that state is also another challenge. And so this, is, this, this becomes a burden to some of their national governments, especially in the welfare system. So there are a number of challenges that we have come across. And we have actually commissioned a study that has actually brought out some of these issues where these people find it difficult to actually access uh, that, I mean, those benefits. This also, by the way, includes... Uh, miners who are actually South Africans, some of them actually even find it very difficult to actually access that uh, type of 
uh, money or the funds that are locked in some of these places. What is an estimate of the amount involved here and how many people are trying to access and can't? Well, the study that we commissioned and perhaps the figures need to be up updated, but by, 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 by some time last year we were talking in excess of uh, almost close to 6 billion rands that were still unclaimed. And uh, part of that obviously belonged to South African miners, but the majority of it, it was calculated that it belonged to ex miner I mean to ex miners who come from Mozambique, Swaziland um, and Lesotho. And shouldn't they get that immediately? They leave South Africa and go to Mozambique or leave the mine and go to the uh, Eastern Cape or wherever they come from? Well, that would be the ideal situation, but it never happens like that. And so that's one of the probably the advocacy calls that the institution like ourselves and the associations of ex-miners will be trying to call for. That that should be something that should be expedited before you know they leave the country. But reality doesn't always work like that. They 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 they, they I mean they often leave and then they have to perhaps meet a particular deadline that they have to do by that time they are already in their countries and so it creates a bit of a challenge even for those who are here by that time they would have gone back to their other rural areas and, and stuff like that i know that some of the paralegals here in this country are trying to help them access that kind of money but it's still a challenge that needs to be addressed and is it in abnormal situations for instance if uh, a miner dies while he's still employed and then the benefits um, have difficulty uh, arriving at th the family wherever they domiciled, or is it just a normal run of event where this money is not getting through? Well, I, I wouldn't know whether to characterize it as really normal or abnormal, but I think that what we are really finding difficult is that this is one sector where we paid attention to, but it could equally be the same in agriculture and other sectors as well, where monthly uh, there are contributions towards these social benefits. But when it's time to really access them, it really becomes difficult. So I'm, I'm not so sure whether the characterization will be abnormal or, or abnormal, but these are real issues, these are real challenges that these people are facing. And does it come directly from the mine, or is it through the Chamber of Mines, or is there a third party anywhere that is... Uh involved uh, that is actually holding on to this money? Who's got the money? Currently we're talking about a number of schemes. I mean one of the well-known schemes is the Miners Workers Provident Fund which which currently according to our calculations holds close to about three billion rands of that amount and then the other amounts are also scattered in some of the schemes that uh, uh, are there. Um, and so, so it's really a number of schemes but the bigger one really is the, is the Miners Provident Fund. And you sort of have tied up Southern Africa <coughs> Trust. How old is that? And it's tied up with the Ford Foundation and then in collaboration with the Southern African Miners Association. I've heard of the Ford Foundation, but I haven't heard of the other two. Give us an update. Right. So the Southern Africa Trust was set up almost eight years ago. And the real mandate was to give platforms to the poor uh, and give them a voice. Uh, so usually what we do, we look at the projects and the activities of the SADC, uh, which is the community itself, and look at their economic program, which is this, uh, the Southern Africa Indicative Development Plan. And what we do is they look at regional integration from a classical point of view. We then put on a poverty lens to it. And, and so where they are looking at mining and they are looking at big companies on mining, we actually look at the plight of the ex-miners where, for example, they are looking at trade, we would look at cross-border informal trade and so forth and so on. So we really put a, a poverty lens to it. The, the Southern Africa Miners Association is actually a culmination of the national associations of ex-miners, those that are in Swaziland, in Lesotho, and so forth and so on. And the idea is that they are building towards a regional uh, agenda. And so they are facing these issues at, an, at a national level, but the, the real point here is that unless countries operate regionally, they will continue to have these challenges at a national level. And so the idea is that we would end up perhaps beginning to work with SADC Secretary to say, how far can we implement the court, for example, on social benefits and social security? And make sure that it actually works across the board and it's not just one country that is looking at it at its own pace. But we have this system that allows a proper flow of the, of the portability of social benefits across the region. So that's really the point where we have this regional association of ex-miners. So the SAMA is actually a, a regional body that tries to build from the national towards the regional uh, agenda. And this six billion, what sort of percentage of the total is it? Um, what would you estimate it is as a, as a percentage of the total that's paid out to, to um, people or the total value of the Provident Fund 
uh, over a period of years. Is, are, are we talking about a percentage? Can you just give me the number of people again and the percentage you perceive? Well, so f in terms of the the numbers of people who are affected, we, we, we're talking about close to 500,000 uh, of ex-miners who are still uh, yet to receive their, their benefits. I don't think I'm, a, I'm, I'm in a position to give the estimates in terms of percentages of what that is, amounts to, but it's a big number, as you can tell. If, if close to 500,000 miners still have to access their benefits, uh, that's a huge issue for us. Even if it was just one person not accessing their benefits, we would still have to mount uh, some kind of uh, advocacy around it. And so what do you hope then to, to achieve with this dialogue, uh, and where will it be held? So the, the dialogue is a, is a follow-up to a number of activities. I mean, we, we have already had um, other dialogues in, in, this, in this issue, but I think then we had not yet f gathered the evidence that we needed, and so our advocacy has to be evidence-based, and so we conducted this research that I talked about. Uh, then we are beginning now to bring the various uh, bodies that are affected. So from, from the government of Mozambique, we are, we are bringing... Uh, permanent secretaries who in this country will be your, 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 I mean your DGs. We are bringing the same from, uh, from, from Lesotho. We bring the same from Swaziland. But we are also bringing people from the Chamber of Mines and, and so forth and so on. So that there is that dialogue and an understanding of the challenges that are facing uh, the, the ex-miners, their beneficiaries, but also their challenges that are facing the companies that are supposed to be releasing these funds. And so there needs to be a common uh, ground where both uh, need to understand what are the challenges that each institution faces in terms of making sure that these benefits are released. You might find that one of the key challenges, as I, as I, as I referred before, is that if there's no proper documentation, no financial institution will release that money. And so that's a challenge that needs to be addressed by the ex-miners, the associations that are helping them. It's got nothing to do with the financial institution. But there could be challenges where the financial institution is actually slow in dispersing those amounts. That's a challenge that is not really the problem of the ex-miner, it's the challenge of the institution. So we need to find a common ground and find a solution where we can easily get this money out to people that benefit. And if not, get a solution where it doesn't just stay with these financial institutions. Perhaps we could even begin thinking about how this money could go back to those uh, home countries and be injected in some of the uh, sectors that need it most. And who are these finan financial institutions? W which financial institutions are, are we talking about? Well, for now, we're talking about the, I mean, the Miners Workers Provident Fund at most. I mean, the rest, I think, we can get the details later. I, do the mining companies administer that themselves? No, no, no. So I think what happens is that the mining companies contribute towards this fund, and the fund is to administer it to, uh, to the ex-miners. So where do you think the sticking point is besides the documentation problem? It's both sides, like I said. So there's the, there's the issue of the documentation side, which is from the ex-miners themselves. Uh, there's also the issue of, you know, people, like I said, they, they, they leave the country before they can even access that. And by the time they try to access, there are a lot of challenges that, have, that, I mean, that come into play. But there are also issues of capacity that we have been told about in some of these, uh, in some of these funds. Uh, so I think it's both really, it's not just one element where we can say there's one area that stops the disbursement of these funds. And is there any contestation? I mean, is there any resistance by the uh, financial institutions saying, no, this is not owed, or is it all acknowledged that it is, but it just has to be processed properly? I think there's acknowledgement that there is a challenge uh, to, uh, regarding the disbursements of these benefits. And so that's why, I mean, when we invite them to this dialogue, all, I mean, all of these people have shown an interest to come. So I think there's an indication that there is a problem and it needs to be solved. And the only way to do so is to actually to bring everyone who is concerned together and have that, I mean, that discussion. The fact that there is money lying in there uh, should be enough reason to show that there's a challenge around it. So I don't think there's any contestation around it. It's the question of finding the mechanisms to actually disperse effectively uh, these benefits to the ex-miners and their beneficiaries.